Hello there. Welcome to Compass, where we look at the life and times of an extraordinary Australian woman, regarded as a prophet by some, shunned by others for her strident advocacy during the campaign for the ordination of women in the Anglican Church of Australia. I'm referring to the late Dr. Patricia Brennan, a missionary doctor, a feminist theologian, a broadcaster with whom I had the great privilege of working, a forensic physician, wife, mother and grandmother. She was all of these things. Sadly, she died of cancer recently at the age of just 66. Central to our story is a final interview she granted my ABC colleague Stephen Crittenden, which was filmed late last year. This is the kind of moment that my mother seemed to deal with better than almost anyone. The moments of greatest significance and symbolism, moments so high in emotion that most people find themselves grasping for poise and articulacy. Somehow, Patricia Brennan found these moments came naturally. Her fearlessness, her spirit, and her way with words left most of us in the shade. She went straight to the heart of matters. She saw the deeper meaning behind the surface. She also gave voice to that which was clearly evident but habitually ignored. Elephants in rooms tended to honk nervously when mum walked through the door. <laughs> Although mum achieved an incredible amount in her 66 years, it would be more fitting to view her life not in terms of what she did achieve, but what she attempted to achieve. She acted like someone who knew that they were expected to play a part in the destiny of the human race. And of course, she did. Her part is over, ours continues. Ours was Irish working class, full of language, full of music, full of fighting. Um, of the best kind, the fights that you, you like them because you can make up after them. And everybody still loved. Patricia Brennan was born in 1944 and grew up in the South Sydney suburb of Hurstville. I was already immersed in language and poetry from a, quite a young age. When I was about seven, I started going to a Steadford and trying to win the crowd there with, um, you know, and especially at school when it was Anzac Day, I always got chosen to say they went with songs to the battle. They were young. True of eye, straight of limb, steady. And you had to get at least three of the teachers crying before it was over. The church I grew up in was a friendly middle Anglican church. It was kind of, I didn't know that church was particularly religious when I was growing up as a kid. We had fates. We had all the traditional things that ordinary parochial Anglicans do and feel very much part of a group of extended families. Conservative, probably, in the sense that I don't think there are any radical thinkers in the congregation, but um, I used to be kneeling in the, con in the choir having quite a few radical thoughts of my own when I was about 12. But it was a comfortable place where there wasn't a big emphasis on doctrine or having to believe anything. If you're a teenager who wants to be with the crowd that um, looks like it's going somewhere, you know, the prefects and the sports types and the thinkers came out of the Interschool Christian Fellowship in a public high school. So it was really when the Billy Graham crusade took off in 1959, there was this passion about belonging and change and, and sort of repentance and doom and gloom and, um, and a terrific campaign to get all the churches there. We all got hauled into that, and that was when I was, um, let me just think, 15. And sin had come between us and God, and we were cut off from God, and we were doomed to outer darkness. We were doomed to the second death. We In that sweeping energy that takes over a movement, it's like a current. You found yourself driven along in it, and it's exciting. I mean, it's great to have 100,000 people in the showground with storm clouds above and a prophet crying, repent, for the day is at hand. It sure beat the average sermon. You're saying I receive Christ openly in front of everyone as my Savior and my Lord. I didn't go forward at the Billy Graham Crusade. Wild horses wouldn't have driven me forward. 
I didn't like group. I never did like group thinking. But I did, prayed fervently that those who needed to go forward would go forward. And my prayers were answered. They went forward in droves. Coming from everywhere, there's plenty of time. Just take your time. What a glorious moment this is. After that, I went to St. Thomas's Kingsgrove, where it was a strong, muscular Christianity and some quite attractive blokes and some people of passion and clarity. After high school, Patricia won a Commonwealth scholarship to study medicine at Sydney University. She met her husband-to-be soon after. Patricia and I met um, on a beach mission team, thing organised by a church-related group. She was a lot of fun, and I suppose something which got me interested was that she didn't seem to be falling over herself to find a bloke. She had a life of her own. Patricia and I were both heavily involved in church activities, and part of the church message was missionary work. And so the idea of going to a, an exotic foreign place to help people uh, and to tell them about the Christian message was very appealing. When we got engaged, she packed off to Africa and left me to organise the wedding and the honeymoon and that sort of thing. I was wanting adventure. I was wanting to expose my thinking to the third world, whatever it was going to be. So I had my chance. I got a ring on my finger and took off as a short-term missionary, which mainly was being a surgeon in Nigeria and Niger for about a year. But Patricia came home to get married, then went back to Africa, this time with her husband. We were working as missionaries in West Africa, in Nigeria and Niger to the north, which borders on the Sahara Desert. And so it was an area of, uh, of Muslim and Christian and animistic people, and very, very, very exotic to our sheltered background. And so uh, it, was, uh, it was a wonderful experience. I was teaching high school and Patricia was working in a hospital. Missions were full of Bible college graduates, not theological graduates. And I had a theological bent. Why do people believe what they believe? What happens if they do what they say they're going to do? And out there, I had free range. I had Southern Baptists who didn't believe in mixed bathing. And I had another group who didn't believe in women wearing makeup. And I had another group where I had to have sleeves in my dresses because my shoulders were going to drive Africans to a state of frenzy, whereas the Africans were topless. And I think that was driving some of the missionaries. You know, it's a complicated thing when you hit cross-culture. We saw something of what it means to tell a person that they should abandon the beliefs they have and take up an entirely other set. It was a very heavy thing to do and something which we found ourselves thinking about a great deal as to the validity of that. But it was the exposure to a kind of a repressive, a, a repressive kind of gravity about religion and a vivacious kind of life in Africans. I loved the way Africans sang. I loved the way they took over religion and absolutely exploded it in terms of music and action. Um, even when they took up the collection, the women liked to walk up the aisle swinging their backsides in a very seductive way and then drop their money in and make their way back. Africa opened Patricia's eyes in more ways than she could have imagined. I saw the tremendous suffering of women, and I think that was the beginning of me seeing. I was up in Niger, um, which is at the edge of the Sahara, and there were no doctors for hundreds of kilometres, and I was forced to do caesarean sections and other things, and the treatment of women was appalling, and I there was no appeal to the men. It was a given that they were less. They were, they were less. They were about the same level sometimes as the beasts. And the fact that missionaries didn't address it politically, be I became aware more and more that it was not to be addressed politically. That wasn't culturally appropriate. It had to be addressed by, you know, preaching the gospel of salvation. Violence was only just emerging in my mind then as associated with gender and associated with religion. 
After two years overseas, they returned to Australia to start a family. Rob was appointed director of a small African mission society, but they were criticised for the way they worked. My husband was a director and I wasn't a proper wifey poo. I did everything that was required of me, but I did more. At that time, we had young children, preschool children, who needed to be cared for. Patricia was already involved in preparing a lot of the literature that went out from the mission, a magazine and so on. And so I suggested that she should do a couple of days a week work in the office and I would be at home with the kids and then I would do the other days. So we shared our time in the office and one of us was always with the kids. It was suggested to us by a member of the mission that we were running the risk of our children becoming homosexual because of the inappropriate role models that we were providing. We felt as that time progressed that it was not something we wanted to continue because of the difference between our views of how things should work and the views of some in the mission, which we respected, but they were quite different views. Defend, o Lord Tamsin, your child. The treatment of women missionaries, once they came home, also rankled with Patricia. I saw this amazing transition from women who were on the mission field, what we called on the field, that amazing term, come home into their own environments and make meek statements about what they were doing. And yet their husbands or men, who only comprised one third of the mission, two thirds were women, um, they could get up in a pulpit and preach. They were allowed to preach. And the women could only talk about their work. Now, I saw that as a status difference. By and large, people had not um, had their minds open to the issue of what the proper role for a woman in the church was. And then some women like Patricia started to realise that things were not the way they thought they ought to be. But nobody had really taken it to the streets, if you like. So a group of them got together to consider forming the movement for the ordination of women. Putting in the word movement for the ordination of women was not popular. They wanted, the first group of women wanted to call Anglican women concerned. Well, concerned about what? And the next one was women in ministry. Well, I said, that's like having, you want to be a doctor and you talk about women in health. And if you call it women's ordination, you will name the problem. That was hugely controversial. We practically didn't get off the ground. So you think about it, the majority of women who were already there intellectually and emotionally were not there politically and theologically. So we had to convince our own side to even go public on the name. The contentious issue of whether to admit women to the full priesthood will be raised again in Sydney this weekend. And once again, a meeting of the General Synod of the Anglican Church is expected to reject the move. But this year, the women have their own lobby group. And today, the movement for the ordination of women met to discuss tactics. Her name is Dr Patricia Brennan, and she's the Germain Greer of the Anglican Church in Australia. For her, ordination is a matter... They realised there had to be a figurehead person who would take the leadership and present their case to the media and to the church leaders. That is the talk at the moment, but I think that's, that's sensationalising something. In, in America, before women were priesthood, that was the threat there. The church would split, that great sections of the church would break away. It's a real danger, though, isn't it? I think there's a greater danger of not doing the right thing. She wasn't looking to be... Uh, a leader, but she was very motivated about the issue. So whether she was leader or not, I think she was happy to get out there and say her piece. It's not just that Pat and I have a different point of view, which we certainly clearly do, but if she gets her way and women are ordained, it changes something fundamental about the priesthood such that many Anglicans will feel that is not a valid priest, that is not someone from whom I can receive Holy Communion or go to to confession. John, the impression given by the Mo group is that the women priests in America no. are, are accepted everywhere in the States. The answer is that, that is not true. John, you cannot, that is simply not true. You cannot argue by consequences. There have been many right things done in this world which have but had disastrous... But, but let, me stay, it, let me stay with it. Right. I really have to sort of assert myself against a good debater. You have made a comment about the fact that when you look in the sanctuary, you see Christ. I would assure you that that is a highly subjectivist notion which has had significant consequences for women for 2,000 years. You are in the sanctuary. You are male. 
you have no problem with seeing other than self. And as for trying to get me into the idea of interchanging the roles of men and women, I won't buy that one. That is a wonderful, devious argument that's going on at the moment, that I am a feminist, or my kind is a feminist, and that we want women to take over men's roles. We are actually saying something totally different. We're saying we are women. Women have demonstrated biologically, psychologically, let alone through scripture being looked at again, that they are equal with men. I, I was a terrible talker, um, I'm sure, um, and still am, but um, talking was, to me, uh, it's an act of freedom. If something needs to be said and it's not being said, then someone's got to say it. Good evening. I'm Patricia Brennan. Welcome to the program. Tonight we're looking at In the early days of the movement, Patricia even made a brief foray into television with her own show. Now when it comes to our current Patricia was always more concerned about the equality of women rather than women holding any particular office or taking any particular role. Indeed, she and I over the years have had some lengthy discussions about what ought to be the future of the ordained priesthood at all. Um, so I think the ord ordination was secondary to equality. But of course, at the same time, MOW was overtly uh, aimed at bringing about ordination of women. For 10 years, the debate over the ordination of women raged in the Anglican Church of Australia and much of the soul-searching was played out in public. Two quite surprising uh, figures who are senior priests in this diocese uh, said quite publicly and openly that they had wept themselves to sleep in, with worry, and I've certainly spent sleepless nights over. In Melbourne, there are women going to bed and crying over the issue, and the frustration that many of them had over a considerable number of years, where a genuine belief in a call by God to ministry has been thwarted by the structures of the church. And here we have people, many of them bishops, racing to get to the finishing line first to lay hands on a woman to make her a priest or deacon. And I doubt that they can do that, but supposing they can, or that is a schismatic act. They deepen the schism. Can you imagine a church in the 20th century which has as its basis for forming the exclusion of women? It will be a tragically antiquated structure. I had a terrible experience before a synod when, from another diocese, a man called out who was very much a supporter of the ordination of women. He called out across a room, get off television, Patricia Brennan. Every time you speak, we lose more votes. Now, that was probably a reasonable perspective on his part because he'd heard people complaining about the image I gave wasn't to the advantage of women who wished to be priests. They had to present themselves as capable of being obedient. They had to present themselves as respectful of order. And they certainly couldn't get up in public and say, say the church is a problem because they're about to join it. We wrote letters to clergy. We did surveys of clergy wives. A group of women went over to England when the Lambeth Conference of Anglican Bishops took place to make their voices heard there. And of course there were some bishops, particularly the American ones, who were very supportive. Uh, others who, were, uh, who didn't want to even talk to them. You've just seen the procession. It's men, it's power, and it's an image of pure masculinity. So that's why we're here. We're disciples. We're Christians, and Australians are probably amongst the Western Anglican churches the most oppressed women. There were church leaders who were not at all happy or comfortable to talk to Patricia, and often brought forward the excuse that they would not talk to her so long as she remained angry. Uh, anger seemed to be regarded as uh, a cardinal sin. You should not be angry. If you're going to talk about it, you should be calm and dispassionate. Well, Patricia was not going to be calm and dispassionate because it was an issue that came from her gut. It's very easy for the Anglican Church to keep rationalising that women are going to be priests one day anyway and to just grind on with political processes. And they'd like us not to be here. A lot of people who support the ordination of women don't want this tatty, ragtaggle mob standing outside celebrations. Anger is a thing that Anglicans do not like, especially in a woman. But it's not about me, and so it was about the public. 
And when the public, anybody, any person responded to a better way of treating someone else, that was the thing that goaded me on. That was the thing that kept me going. Even though I was full of self-doubt at times and, and being attacked by both sides and feeling it not as tough as I looked, but it was about the fact that ordinary people were responding well outside the church and showing their disappointment with organised religion and showing their passion for change, for the better. I do not believe that there is any clear-cut statement in our creeds, in our Gospels, or anywhere else, or any other commandment that we are to fulfil that says, Thou shalt not ordain a woman. I think we realised we were getting somewhere when bishops and other senior church people in other parts of the country started breaking ranks with their Sydney colleagues and suggesting that maybe the ordination of women should be considered. They weren't sympathetic, they became sympathetic, and we had a, a real job convincing them because we were seen as secular. Because the women's movement had been secular, when we came out of that women's movement, it was the secular threat to the authority of religion. But we rediscovered that there was plenty of liberation in scripture, in history, it had been done before many times, but now we were doing it in our time. And the bishops came on board one by one. Australia has its first women priests. In an historic ordination ceremony in Perth today, the Anglican Church gave its blessing for 10 women to celebrate the Eucharist. The investiture marked the end of a long struggle in the church community and the courts for acceptance to the priesthood. Ordaining the women today, the Archbishop of Perth said it was a day of liberation and expanding horizons. Today we ordain 10, but we liberate tens of thousands from the stereotypes with which they have been bound. I present to you Elizabeth, Kay, Pamela, Jennifer, Robert, Teresa, Catherine, Judith, Joyce, Robin and Elizabeth, now admitted to the order of priesthood in the Church of God. Having helped achieve victory, the ordination marked a turning point for Patricia. That came to an end for me. Women were becoming priests. It was over to them now. So the next thing for me was back to medicine. Patricia had maintained her work in the medical field right through. Some of the time she ran a general practice. Uh, some of the time she worked for the breast clinic uh, in the city. Um, some of the time she worked for the Aboriginal Legal Service. It was always uh, work which enabled her to express, I think, her concern for individual people and in particular for women. Justice needs to have outrage. So my outrage then went into medicine where I saw the general medical profession was doing nothing rigorous about violence to the bodies of women and men. Patricia worked in the hospital system, examining victims of sexual assault and testifying in cases that went to court. She quickly found the weak spots to achieving justice. If you are raped, the chances of there being um, injury that's going to be proof beyond all reasonable doubt that you have been raped is not the question in court usually, it's whether you can prove you consented or not. And that's a very subjective issue. So that enormously destructive rapes can be going on without the slightest bit of evidence that can stand. So my interest became, where does hard evidence lie? This led her to become a doctor of forensic medicine with a focus on sexually abused women and children. Speaking as a doctor, um, I would say that there's a great ignorance in the public about sexual um, behaviour in, in situations of offence. More recently, she found herself at odds with the New South Wales Health Department in advocating for the use of photographic evidence in sexual assault cases. There was a strong and still is some uh, movement within the health profession uh, to prevent that on the basis that, that photographing genital injuries is a, a re-assault, is an assault all over again of the victim. Patricia felt that if the victim was agreeable that 
photographic evidence was going to improve the chances of a conviction. And so my point was that in terms of justice, we need the best evidence, we need evidence that stands if there is consent. And after all, these women and these men consent to swabs being collected, they consent to all sorts of humiliating examinations, but the people who, can, who submit to those examinations in the hands of compassionate, good doctors and nurses come out greatly relieved usually by having been properly examined by someone who's well trained. To me, Patricia was a person of intense intelligence, of intense energy, and an intense desire to see goodness and truth prevail in the world. And when she came across situations that seemed to be needful in that area, she was always on the edge of her seat, ready to, to go into battle. In November last year, Patricia was diagnosed with advanced pancreatic cancer. Everything falls apart. You don't care about your files anymore. You don't care about your bills anymore. I don't feel about all the photographic articles I haven't written anymore. Suddenly it all stops, bang. So how have we dealt with it? Um, shock. Um, and then, but we had a good cartoon that my husband and I had cut out and stuck up somewhere for the New Yorker with a doctor saying to a patient, and why not you? And, uh, and so the why me stuff went straight out the window. And I thought, I'm 66, a pretty good run. There are people with cancer in their 20s and their 30s. And if they, um, if they tell me they don't have everything that they usually offer because my cancer is more advanced than I think it is, or I know it is, then I'll um, turn around and come home and I'll go for alternative medicine like a, like a rat up a drain pipe. That's my plan. Not exactly, it's not true to say that about rats, but I'll be keen to try whatever I can. Not because I think my life is all that significant, in, uh, people come and go all the time, but because there might be another revolution, Stephen. I'd hate to miss it.